So, who really invented the internet? Or the computer? Or that cell phone in your pocket? We know who invented the light bulb and the guy who figured out how to mass produce the automobile. Both hired lots of people and helped grow the American economy. But that was a long time ago. About that same time, in 1930, this building opened in Chicago. The Merchandise Mart was the largest building in the world. Four million square feet large. Today, in addition to massive wholesale businesses, it's home to business incubators, like this one called 1871. People gather here to start new businesses and to find support for their new ideas. There are people here with great ideas, but to launch a business, they need money. There are people out there with money who are looking for a great idea, and they're not afraid of risk. I'll bet you've never heard of Tom Perkins, Arthur Rock, or Don Valentine. They backed inventors like Rob Campbell, Glenn Bosak, and Sandy Lerner. Never heard of them either? How about Steve Jobs? You've heard of him, right? These are people who created partnerships that changed the world. Their tools were ingenuity, commitment, hard work, and something called venture capital. Venture capital is when people invest a big chunk of money to help start or expand a business. The people who do this are called venture capitalists. Sometimes they fail and lose it all, and sometimes they succeed beyond anyone's wildest expectations, as you're about to see. These people and the entrepreneurs they finance are inventing the future, and we should be very happy they've been willing to put their money at risk because we all benefit. These are the people who are behind most of the recent advancements in communication, computer, and medical technology. So, shouldn't we be thankful that we live in a country that's produced so many great inventions because people have had the freedom to invest their money in new ideas, even if there was no guarantee of success? There's no doubt about it. The combination of entrepreneurship and venture capital have always been, and remain, an essentially American phenomenon. American entrepreneurs, backed by venture capitalists, continue to improve the lives of millions of people here at home and around the world. Now that's a big idea. I was a nerd, a highly motivated, impatient, driven workaholic who accidentally got some sort of social polish at a school for nerds, MIT. My father was a sole proprietor of this little candy store. I worked there, I clerked. I was six years or seven years old. <laughs> My father was a very petty union member, and we used to have a lot of arguments once I understood what a union was, and, and he couldn't understand why I was so adamantly opposed to the unions. It probably has to do with my deep-seated sense of disobedience. When I was 12 or 13, I was trying to figure out how to earn some money in the summertime. So I went down to the local general manager of the Sylvania operation. He said the smallest amount that he could sell me would be a half a freight car full of light bulbs. So I got this wagon, this big wagon, and I went around and I sold light bulbs for a whole summertime. I called it the Bright Boy Light Bulb Company. <laughs> These men were just young guys from modest means who thought they could help build innovative companies. This is the story of a handful of men who stirred up a revolution in finance and technology because they saw opportunity where others only saw risk. We are now entering our fourth generation of computers. In 1976, the computer was about to get personal expanding beyond the government, institutions, and businesses to enter the home. 
For venture capitalists, this represented the opportunity of a lifetime. In 1976, the only people who believed in the personal computer were the geeks and nerds who gathered at homebrew computer clubs. At one such club, 21-year-old Steve Jobs had partnered with Steve Wozniak to create a circuit board kit they called the Apple One. Steve Jobs was working at Atari at the time, so the most obvious person to ask for startup money was his boss, Nolan Bushnell. They needed an investment, and uh, they offered me a third of Apple computer for $50,000, and I said, gee, I don't think so. A big mistake. But I said, call Don Valentine, because Don had a high probability of seeing the opportunity. I went to Steve's house, and his question for me, tell me what I have to do to have you finance me. I said, we have to have someone in the company who has some sense of management. He said, fine, send me three people. I sent him three candidates. One he didn't like, one didn't like him, and the third one was Mike Markla. He called me up and said, there's two guys over in Los Altos that, that uh, could really use your help. I think I was 32, and I retired from Intel. But one day a week, I would help people start companies and write business plans. And I did it for free, just for the interaction with bright people that had a lot of fire in their belly. So I went over and talked to the boys. <laughs> the two of them did not make a good impression on people. I mean, they were bearded, they didn't smell good. But Waz had designed a really wonderful, wonderful computer. And so I told them, I said I'd help them write a business plan. And the business plan said that uh, with $142,000, we could be cash flow positive in nine months. And I came to the conclusion that we could build a Fortune 500 company in less than five years. I said I'd put up the money that was needed. Not only did he write the check, Mike Markle came out of retirement becoming the president and CEO of Apple. His first order of business, build a board of directors. And the first call he made was to Arthur Rock. Arthur would have missed Apple if it weren't for Mike Markle. Jobs and Wozniak came up to see me, and they were very unappealing. Goatee, long hair, Markula said, well, before you make up your mind, there's a computer show, and you ought to come down and see what's going on. There was this huge auditorium, and there was this booth with everybody around it. I couldn't even get next to it, and it was the Apple booth, and I made an investment. Then I got a call from Don Valentine. <laughs> he says, I want to put some money in that company. I said, OK, you've got to come on the board then. Don's background is sales and distribution and customer satisfaction. Arthur's expertise comes from the way financial markets work and uh, how to choose people. Taking his place alongside the venture capital luminaries was the young Steve Jobs, who had never even seen the inside of a boardroom. There was one board meeting that he took his shoes off and put his bare feet up on the, on the table. And I said, you're excused until you can come back here and act like a board member. He put his shoe back on and everything was fine. He just needed some training and some manners. <laughs> In the early 80s, a new kind of company began to attract attention in Silicon Valley. A DataQuest report says there are now 27,000 software programs on the market, with a new product being introduced every 11 minutes. Dick Kramlick had been listening to endless pitches from software entrepreneurs in his office at New Enterprise Associates. One day, an entrepreneur named Rob Campbell marched in. I was flying from Boston to California, and I was sitting in the back of the plane in the cheap seats where entrepreneurs are supposed to sit, and I noticed half the people on the plane had their briefcases open, and they had overhead transparencies, and then they were marking them up. 
That really was the genesis of PowerPoint. I was really impressed with PowerPoint. You see, you sort of automate a very cumbersome process. And when you see it, you know it. It's just that it just goes right through your bones. Dick Cranlick's firm provided Rob Campbell's company named Forethought with an initial round of funding to develop this new software. But while the Forethought team was working on PowerPoint, the company was giving its venture capitalists cause to worry. Any new business seldom does what's written in the business plan. And we had a multitude of problems. Campbell's company was burning through its investment money fast. He approached Kramlick and his partners looking for another infusion of cash. My partner got up and said, you have one product where you pay too much in the royalties and the other one, which is not going to work, so they're saying no. And I said, no more money? He said, no more money. Despite his partner's doubts, Dick Kramlick wasn't ready to let PowerPoint go so easily. I said, you know, this presentation product is really a pretty good product. So I said, would you all mind if I did it myself? And they said, well, you can do what you want to do. It's not going to be a conflict as long as we don't have to put any more money in. I said, I'm going to fund this company myself. I remember telling Dick, I said, Dick, you did not make a mistake. I thought it would be a million dollar product right out of the chute. And instead of a million dollars out of the chute, I think we had two and a half to three. It was much better than what I had hoped for. So I was thinking this is enough to validate a public offering. I was nervous about access to capital. He said, actually, we've been approached by Microsoft and they had a presentation product that's not nearly as good as PowerPoint. And they would like to acquire us and kill their own project. I said, if that's the way you want to go, it's okay with me. In 1984, Cisco Systems was a two-person company, the husband and wife team of Len Bosak and Sandy Lerner. Sandy and Len were early evangelists for what would one day be called the internet, but which in 1984 was really just a jury-rigged network of computers used at universities and in the military. Cisco's product was called a router, and it solved a very big problem. It allowed all kinds of computer systems to talk to each other easily for the very first time. It was a desperately needed product, but no one would finance Cisco. We tried from the very beginning to, to get funding. Uh, we just weren't successful. Armies of people have told me that they saw it before we did and they turned it down. They took the position that this was an untenable business model. I, I, I don't think in their position I would have disagreed with that. But I wasn't in their position and I did disagree with it. The person who got us involved with Cisco said, you are probably the only person in North America who would be willing to deal with these people. If you were designing hard to get along with people, they got the model right down. We were difficult to work with. You know, certainly there's the mindset that has to go along with years and years and years of people saying that, you know, you can't do what you say you're going to do. You can't make money even if you could do it. We bought a third of the company for $2.8 million. And we had an agreement that basically said, you get a third of the company and we get a third of the company and we will find the people to run this company. Sandy and Lynn agreed to step down into new roles. And Don Valentine recruited John Morgridge, a veteran of several high-tech startups, to run Cisco. Morgridge's first task was to address what he and Don Valentine saw as a troubled corporate culture. We hired a shrink. He eliminated fighting in, op in the open hallways. Physical fighting. <laughs> As Cisco grew, a culture clash developed between the original employees and the new hires. 
and ultimately, this clash centered on Sandy Lerner. Silicon Valley has not always been the place where the customers thought of first. They may, in some places, be thought of second or third, but Sandy was ensuring that the customer was thought of first. Unfortunately, at the expense of some of the other major managers. I had very much alienated the other people in the company because I saw them, rightly or wrongly, as the people I was trying to protect the customers from. By her own admission, she would detonate usually in my office. Finally, one day, my assistant said the conference room is filled with eight Cisco employees demanding to see you. All of the vice presidents of the company were in the conference room. They walked up Sand Hill Road and said, either she goes or we go. John called me into his office. He said, you know, you're now worth so much money, it really doesn't make any sense for you to work this hard. You know, I think it's just a good idea if you just retire at this point. I said, but John, I, I have a lot to do here. I, I don't really want to retire right now. I was 35 years old. And he said, well, today's your last day. You know, this idea that 45% of founders will be gone in 18 months. In retrospect, that was clearly the mindset. I think each of them went away with 170 million. I don't know how people think of what comes next after the first 170 million, but uh, I don't think they've ever forgiven either of us. Technology keeps evolving, and that ever since Leonardo da Vinci, it's been e evolving, and it will continue to evolve through good times and bad times. Venture capital is here to stay, though. Well, I get my greatest satisfaction out of thinking back on the companies that I helped start. Without venture capital, the future wouldn't happen nearly as quickly. I don't think, and I would not, say that Silicon Valley is the result of good venture capitalists. Not at all. Nice to sit in the glow of your adulation, but without the entrepreneurs, you're nothing. You have to have these real people with the ideas and their willingness to commit their life 